What is up, everybody? This is going to be a special edition of Simplify Podcast. I'm actually, you know, I'm going to try to switch it up a bit. Like the solo podcasts, they're fun, but eventually it's like, eventually I run out of things to talk about a little bit. So I think implementing this idea I had the other day is going to be really interesting. So I'll just give you an overview of what the idea actually is. Right now I'm reading like a motherfucker right now. I'm reading so much. And I plan to read a ton coming up. Like I've already made up my mind of exactly what I'm going to do for the next three months. Probably update you guys on that in a, in a podcast here shortly, but I want to keep these more specific to the objective at hand. So what I plan on doing, actually, it's going to be pretty fun is uh, coming up soon. I'm going to be reading like two books a week and I'm going to announce these books ahead of time so that you guys are able to purchase them. If you so choose and read along with me. And the cool thing about that is, I'm going to be doing a podcast on each one or maybe just like one. Like I'll probably read two books a week and then choose one to do a podcast on the one I find the most beneficial. But coming up here soon, not not the first couple, but coming up here soon, I'm going to be getting a new phone number and a new phone. And then you guys, this Roadmaster or Roadcaster actually gives you the ability to connect to the phone. So you guys can call in live and I can talk to you through the mic and we can just talk about the book. And so the cool thing about this is going to be like, not only can I interact with you guys on a non-business specific uh, topic, basically, because I I don't know if I could get through like taking phone call after phone call about drop shipping and all this. It's like, I think this is cooler because not only will it help my retention rate, but it'll help your retention rate. And then it'll help anybody watching's retention rate. Because what I do with these books is I'll go through and I'll highlight the things that I find most important. And uh, after I do that, I actually go into my my book book that I write all the quotes down because retention comes from reading, writing, and listening, and talking, honestly. So reading, got one phase through it. Writing, I write it all down. And then talking and then listening, that's the two aspects of the, the solo podcast coming up. So if uh, if a solo podcast has a title of a book in it, you already know what's going on. I'm actually probably going to, Hold it up like this for the for the thumbnail. Let me get a thumbnail clip real quick. Okay, got it. <laughs> so this one, um, it's called The Power of Discipline by Daniel Walter. I found it to be really good. And I, I totally expect some of these books to not be that great. But I plan on reading two books a week and possibly three. One being an audio book, being a classics like um, Catcher in the Rye and all that stuff just to there's some classical literature in there, but one for sure is going to be a self I mean a self improvement book, and then the other is going to be an autobiography or biography. I'm currently reading the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, which is fucking crazy to read. It, he wrote it to his son, and then it was published as a book. But just to see someone of such important, like to someone who import, contributed so much to this society, in his own words, telling his story, it's pretty amazing, and you can get just as much from an autobiography from someone inspirational as you can a self-improvement book so um yeah let's go ahead i guess uh, i'll give you an update on myself like uh i'll tell you what i was in a bad not even a bad i guess it was a bad bad slash weird headspace february and march so i'm glad i'm out of that guys because i think it was just um i think the cold was getting to me i think the search for the apartments were getting to me i got it I think uh, possibly getting that dog was was getting to me. So I got that all out of my system, and I just went through, like, a weird phase. We all go through weird phases sometimes. That one was specifically especially weird. But now I'm I'm feeling much better, and I'm feeling uh, more clear-headed, most definitely. So anyway, let's hop into this book, okay? So, again, it's The Power of Discipline, How to Use Self-Control and Mental Toughness to Achieve Your Goals. And I think that's what a lot of us are missing nowadays. It's like uh, they don't really teach you mental toughness in school or definitely they don't teach you how to be disciplined because discipline, every successful person will tell you discipline is way more important than motivation. Motivation's crap. Discipline can be used every day. Motivation comes and goes. So first thing I have highlighted is uh, in the same way as the body gets tired after it has been put through a strenuous workout, Self-discipline also loses strength when it's been put to work and worn down. That's very true. That's very true. You know, um, 
instead of going through each one of these, I'm going to go ahead and grab the book I actually wrote this down into because I simplified it even more. Like there's some things I highlighted that I didn't really feel too much importance and I'm, I simplified long phrases. So I'm going to cut it right here. I think this would be better if I just write down what I have written down. Okay, sorry about that delay. I mean, this is my first one. So, you know, I'm kind of getting used to it. So I'm just going to go ahead and get to the page where I started writing it down. And then I can like kind of like as I go through it, I can relate it to whatever I felt in my life. And then as you guys call in, you can actually relate it to whatever you're feeling and we can mutually bond or mutually just like conversate over that. Okay, so my first point was, okay, what I just said, like working out, willpower can be drained down or worn down when used too much. I guess this is basically saying, you know, if you're constantly 24 seven using willpower and discipline in your life and you never relax, eventually that's going to deplete all the way. Like you have to, you have to relax. And uh, it goes on to say how the brain working in survival mode is what is what makes it craves instant gratification. So that's, that's two and the same right there. It's saying that when you're constantly on the go and you're constantly trying to be disciplined 24 seven and you're always like structuring this and structuring that and never just like relaxing, your brain's going to go into survival mode because it's, it seems like it's always fighting, 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 which then it's going to crave that instant gratification. This is why people go on, you know, strict diets and they follow diets all the time. I mean, strict, strict, strict diets and they always follow this diet. And then eventually 90% of people fail in that because their body's going into survival mode because it's maybe not eating enough or eating very strictly. So it's trying to crave instant gratification. Like it wants the sugar and all that. So it's all about the balance. Yeah, and, and then it says, uh, the best way to build self-discipline is removing temptation. This is big facts right here. I've noticed that myself. Like, that's why I don't keep too much food in my vicinity. Unfortunately, I got this fucking market on the roof that has, like, all these chips and, and candy and all this stuff. I'm like, God damn, they need to remove that ASAP. I can't, I can't take because even if I don't have it in my apartment, I know I can go up one flight of stairs and already be there and begin whatever I want. So removing the temptation is the best option I found for sure. Uh, and then just not leaving in my case uh, is the best because like I'll get super hungry late at night and I'll just keep checking the fridge as if something new is going to be there. Nothing new is ever in there. It's true. And your level of discipline will control your level of success in employment, relationship, finances, etc. This one's super important because I remember Umar Ashraf talking about this. He goes, if you don't have structure in your life, if you don't have structure with your family relationship, your your um, your personal relationship, structure in your uh, mental health, your physical health, you're not going to have structure when you're trading stocks. And I noticed that myself, like the less structure that I had implemented into my life, the less structure, like I, the less strict I was on the actual trading I was doing, which obviously can be very detrimental. So it, it applies across everything. If if you have self-discipline, and usually it's one thing in people's lives, lives, I've noticed. When they break one thing, it's a domino effect. Like if they want to do this and they're very strict on, say, you know, not eating sugar, and then they eat sugar, everything starts to fall and then now they're not working out and now they're not working or now they're not, you know, going after their dreams or whatever. It usually has one thing. There's usually one main temptation that once someone breaks, they break all temptations. Inactivity leads to one place failure. And that's the one thing that a lot of these books actually get a bad stigma for. It's like, guys, you can read all day. That's what Dan Pena was saying once. He was like, I know people, We've read 270 books and how much money have they made? Nothing. That guy's intense. But yeah, I mean, that's something to keep in, keep in mind for sure. As motivation, inspiration, all this, or even learning anything means nothing if you don't go apply it. I've seen it time and time again. Like so, so many people will take the time to learn something, learn everything about it. And then at the end of the day, they never try. And then this part I actually found really, really interesting so a self-disciplined person is confident because they know they are the best versions of themselves and they live by their word. That means if you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it and you actually end up doing it. Or if you're going to say, if you say you're going to keep a secret and you actually keep it, that is self-discipline right there. And if you tell somebody or you don't do it, it, the confidence from other people in you definitely will deplete. And I think it's really interesting to show how it's a confident person 
self-discipline because they know they are the best version of themselves. The confidence is sourced in their constant battle with themselves to become the best person possible that they know they can be. And I can definitely relate to that too, for sure. It's just, I've noticed when I've done, I've become like less disciplined, I become less confident. And then the more disciplined I am, the more work I get done, the more confident I become. It's like very, very true, this one right here. Okay, so there's this thing called the status quo bias, and it's the human disposition to cling onto what we're familiar with instead of reaching for the unknown. And the status quo bias, this is the status quo bias is really responsible for so many people never leaving their hometowns, never quitting the job that they know they don't want. The status quo bias is responsible for so many failures of potential major successes because people they want to cling to what they're familiar with instead of reaching into the unknown and reaching into the unknown is where the glory is found because and that's where you do things that nobody's ever done before you discover things no one's ever discovered before and that's where you find real happiness like that's why i love jordan i can't wait to read his book jordan peterson he says the reason so many people aren't happy nowadays is because they're they got nothing to struggle for they got nothing that they're fighting for like the whole point of life isn't about freedom this is why my thinking has changed dramatically since listening to him it's like the whole point of life isn't about freedom it's about taking upon responsibility and 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 treating that responsibility the best you can like responsibility is what brings fulfillment and you can't have fulfillment without happiness but you can't have happiness without fulfillment which can make you fall into the happiness trap so that's something to really keep in mind next time like you're you're like a little scared to like try something new or or try or attempt something. It's like, remember, that's the status quo bias. You're just trying to remain to the status quo. Like the more, and then it says, uh, the more you get up earlier, the easier it becomes. So if you're trying to get up early, that's something that stood out to me because I've been trying to get up earlier and early and it's like, oh, I don't want to get up, but I just got to keep in mind, like the more I do it, the easier it becomes. And I think that's really about anything. If you, if you want, if you plan on say, reading for four hours a day and the first day is going to suck. The second day is going to be harder. Third day is going to be the hardest. But then after you get that 72 hour jump, you're just going to keep going. You're just going to keep going. And it's, it's going to become easier and easier because it's starting to become implemented into your actual psyche. Ooh, sorry. Ooh. And then this, he was a hard hitter. This, uh, this Daniel Walter was a hard hitter. He goes, the status quo bias ensures your dreams will never get fulfilled. Because how can you fulfill your dreams if you never go outside of your comfort zone? Unless your dreams are already within your comfort zone. In that case, what are your dreams then? I'd reevaluate your dreams. Okay. The Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning-Kruger effect is when, is when, one is incompetent in an area and real and fails to realize how bad they actually are. I think we all know people like this where someone thinks that they're super funny and they have no idea how unfunny they are. Or someone thinks that they're like super cocky and they think they're all successful when they really don't understand what successful is. Like I, I always make that comparison. It's just like someone who makes $200,000 a year here in St. Louis and is gets cocky about it and needs to take a trip to LA <laughs> Because that $200,000 is not going to go that far. And you're not going to be that cocky when you're being surrounded by people making $200 million a year. Easy. So that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's when you don't know what you don't know. And a lot of people will fall into that trap. They'll get a little good at something. There's two types of people. Someone who gets good at something and the better they get, the more they realize they don't know. Or someone who gets good at something and then considers themselves the best false confidence, a big difference then from confidence, and doesn't proceed with the learning at all. That The Dunning-Kruger effect is responsible for that because the more familiar you become with something, the less likely you'll actually consider yourself an expert because there's so much more, um, or the fact that it will diminish. Like, Because you could have a little success, say, in stocks, and then start thinking you're an expert, and then everything comes crashing down. And then you realize there's so much more to learn. Um, The only difference between successful and unsuccessful are their habits followed every single day. Daily habits. I think habits and scheduling is two different things because your schedule can be habits. 
And that's where the the whole realm of discipline comes in. It's just like following those habits that you want to keep, not following the habits that you know are no good for you. And then you end up doing them anyway. And then something bad inevitably happens. Like that is the way that it goes for so many people, unfortunately. And that has gone in my life before too, for sure. And that's why I just, I, I learn from it. I read about it and I correct it as you should too. And this is, uh, he goes on to talk about how it's so important how you should make your bed in the morning because making your bed in the morning doesn't just mean making your bed in the morning. It means doing your morning routine because your morning routine in the morning will set the entire pace of the day. So if you set, if you make your bed in the morning and then read for 20 minutes and then meditate for 10, you're going to have a so much better of a day if you just get up and leave. Because you didn't do, you didn't set the pace for the day. You didn't set that, you didn't show your mind or yourself that you're going to follow the habits that you intend to be to become the person you want to be right at the beginning. So then now that you didn't make your bed or do your meditation or work out in the morning, now you might eat unhealthy. And now that you ate ate in a little unhealthy, uh, you might as well, you know, milk it for Wald's God, and you'll just start tomorrow. So you'll eat unhealthy the rest of the day and not work out. It's very common. It's very common. And don't forget, your evening routine is just as important as your morning routine. Just as important. Because that is what caps off the day. And if you let that slip, it could leak into the next day, or you just won't have a completely fulfilled day. Okay, so there's this one thing that the Marines believe to be true, which I also think is true, called the 40% rule. And some of you have probably heard this from David Goggins, but the 40% rule basically states that when the mind is telling the body that it's tired, you've only hit 40% of your potential energy. So next time like you're struggling at the gym and you're like, I can't go on, I can't go on, just know that if, if a line was chasing you, you could go on for a long, way longer of time, right? So when your body or when your mind's telling your body it's tired, just remember you still got over two times more uh, endurance left. And then that is where greatness is formed right there. Greatness, physical health and greatness and mental health because you can just push through. And when you push through, your confidence becomes even greater. And then your, your endurance range becomes even higher because now your brain's starting to realize, oh, there's so much more that this body can be pushed to. Oh, and uh, I really like this part, guys. So there's this one thing called the 10-minute rule that he talks about. And he said he uses a bag of chips, for example. He's like, okay, so say you want a bag of chips right now, which it's okay to want a bag of chips, but wait 10 minutes for the, in order for, to get that bag of chips. And just think about it. Do some breathing. He calls it, He does box breathing where you breathe in for four seconds and then breathe out for four seconds and then until your heart rate returns to normal. And if you still want it after 10 minutes, go get the bag of chips. There's nothing wrong with that. But at least at the very least, even though you did eat the chips, you delayed instant gratification, which is making, which is training your brain to not do things for instant gratification all the time. So, yeah. Okay. So Parkinson's law, you will fully fill the time allotted for a certain task so give tight time deadlines to yourself. This is so true. The Parkinson's law basically states that if you give a group of people two weeks to work on a project, they'll get it done in two weeks. But if you give a group of people one week to finish that same project, they'll get it done in one week. And it's because people naturally will fill up the time. So it's like very important to like keep time deadlines Keep time deadlines for what you actually want to do. Close time deadlines so you're not wasting so much time. Not like anything you think you can accomplish in a month, give yourself like a week or two to accomplish it. And then now that you have that deadline set, according to the Parkinson's law, it's likely that you'll be able to actually achieve that. And uh, the core of self-discipline, this is doing what you need to do whether you like it or not. And this is what uh, Jocko was talking about on his Instagram today. He's like, if you came here for motivation, get the fuck out of here. Because guess what? I woke up at 4.30 a.m. and I had no motivation. But you know what got me up into the gym? Discipline. Discipline got that. 
So don't come at me with this bullshit motivation. Discipline is what got me out of the bed and will is what will get you out of bed every morning. I'm like, damn, that's, that's actually pretty true. That's actually pretty true. And then this is actually a reason why I'm doing, um, why I'm testing these solo book podcasts out. It's uh, because of the 70% rule I read about. And it basically states, if you're 70% sure that something's going to work, do it. Just do it. 70%. And I'm 70% sure that this is going to work. I'm, I'm 70, based on the responses I got on Instagram, like, I still, obviously, I'm, like, adapting and trying to find the best way to do these solo podcasts in terms of the books, but I'm 70%, that I'm more than 70% that this will work. I just need to, you know, understand the formatting behind it and then, you know, implement the calls and everything like that. So, yeah. Inspiration fades when your focus becomes getting through the day and not a long-term goal. This is uh, this goes back to that instant gratification. If you default to just getting through the day, you're going to get into like kind of like survival mode, and you're just going to be like, oh, whatever. I'm just gonna I'm gonna go eat some cake. I'm gonna go eat some booty. I'm gonna go eat some fucking <laughs> whatever you want. Uh, but if you have a long term goal ahead, like not only is that going to bring you so much happiness to be knowing that you're like drawn closer to the actual goal every single day that's going to give you the confidence but it's not your focus isn't going to be on i just need to make it through this day and then i'll be okay and then i'll be okay no because you got to be focusing on a longer term goal every time you step out of your comfort zone your willpower and tolerance for discomfort increases and this is why you got to be very comfortable with being uncomfortable whatever you are comfortable with do the opposite because the reason so many people are undisciplined and a reason why I've been a lot of undisciplined, uh, especially since coronavirus happened, just because I was not stepping out of my comfort zone because I was so uncomfortable with what was happening in the world around me that I was like hesitant to step out of my comfort zone, which is why when I went to Colorado, um, I felt great. But I think I don't have really mistakes, but I think uh, a sign of seek, uh, status quo bias and seeking back into comfort was when I moved back in here in St. Louis instead of just like moving straight to Miami or um, or another place that I actually really enjoyed because guys I really don't think uh, I don't think being in St. Louis was healthy for me at all. I'm sorry to break through um, in the middle of this book thing, but I really don't think being here for the past eight or nine months was healthy even in the least bit for me, and that's my fault for sure. I won't get that wrong. I. Uh, but, you know, I was going through a life lost in L.A. And looking back, if anyone can learn from me, don't listen to that status quo bias. It was very comforting, a very comforting feeling to know I'm moving back in, uh, to this apartment building. And it was a very comforting feeling for me to know that I was going back to where I felt most comfortable. And to tell you the truth, even in Los Angeles, I wasn't feeling comfortable. But... Looking back, that was the happiest I had ever been probably because I was uncomfortable. And I think there's a lot to be learned from that. And that's why moving forward, like this lease ends at the end of this month. And where the my plan is a little uncomforting, but like I know that if I actually really want to truly be happy and fulfilled, that's the path I'm going to have to go. Because I can, we cannot get, we cannot be tricked by the status quo bias, guys. We just cannot. And, um, lesson learned for me, for sure. It, I mean, it's, I mean, when you don't know anybody in the, in those States, I mean, I know a couple people for sure. Don't get me wrong. But when you, when you leave your family and friends and all that, it can be an uncomfortable feeling, but if you really want to grow and you really want to change into a better person, that's just what you're going to have to do. So that gets me into like, um, Say you have like urges. So maybe you have an addiction to food or like uh, bad food or maybe you have an addiction to weed or maybe you have an addiction to alcohol. This was really, this really stood out for me right now. Uh, what he calls urge surfing. So whenever you have that urge, it's super important to disconnect your identity from the urge itself. So say you're trying to start, stop smoking cigarettes and someone offers you a cigarette. You don't want to, Say, no thanks, I'm trying to quit. You go, I am not a smoker. Because trying is a recipe for failure. If you just say, I'm trying to. No, you are not a smoker because you're associating your, your entire identity is being associated 
with smoking. So if you don't admit, if you if you still admit that you're a smoker, you're going to become a smoker again. It's inevitable. But if you disconnect, that's the, that's the issue. Like your urges are, you can't allow your urges to become a part of your identity. And so when you do feel this urge to say smoke a cigarette, they say you just want to do box breathing, breathe in and out for four seconds. And then close your eyes and just imagine the urge as a wave. And just like waves in the oceans, they peak and then they come back down. But guess what? They're not down forever. Then they come back and then they come back down. But if, if you understand, it's basically you're not trying to block the waterfall. You're taking a step back and watching it. And as you, especially if you meditate on it, as that urge is coming to a peak, you're going to understand that it's now at the peak and it's going to come right back down to where it was and it all returns to that neutral zone. And so urge surfing is just watching the waves. And yeah, so your terminology is super important when it comes to that. If it's about cake or if it's about booty, you don't say, you, you want to say, I have an urge to eat booty, not I feel like eating booty. <laughs> He actually wrote, I have, you don't, you want to say or think I have an urge to eat cake, not I feel like eating cake. Because if you say I feel like eating cake, you're associating that with yourself instead of saying I have an urge to when you're disassociating it with yourself, if that makes sense. This guy's right here was a major, major breakthrough for me. I have an urge to eat cake, not I have. I, I am a cake eater or anything like that. This was a huge breakthrough for me because I, I will always think about it in terms of that now. Like, I have an urge to do this, but I myself don't want to do that. Because, like, say, like, uh, like when I put on some weight during coronavirus and then I put it off, I took it off at the beginning of the year, I realized that now looking back, like, or looking back, I wanted... I didn't really want to start eating badly. I just had urges to, and I gave into the urges because, you know, of how cold it was and how I was becoming a little more undisciplined than I normally would just because I fell into that status quo bias of just comfort, and I was surrounded by comfort and pleasure, comfort and pleasure, comfort and pleasure, comfort and pleasure. I'll admit it, you know, and I'm so far from that, luckily, uh, but the, the urges still come, and and with this information that's been presenting me in this book, it's, it's really unbelievable. And, um, like when you, if you fight the urges and make them stronger, like studies have shown, if you just try to fight off the urges, no, I'm not going to smoke cigarettes or no, I'm not going to eat that cake or anything like that. No, I'm not going to, I'm just going to think about something else. You're, you're giving it so much power instead of just taking a step back and watching the wave come and then watching the wave go. So, for urge surfing, this is his specific steps on how to do it. Pay attention to where the urge is coming. Focus all attention on that area and observe the sensations that you're feeling. Like when you feel an, an urge coming, pay f close attention to where that urge is coming from. Is it coming from your stomach? Is it coming from your head? Is it coming from your heart? Spend two minutes focusing on breath, box breathing. And imagine every sensation as a wave and pay attention to the feelings, uh, pay attention to the changes you are feeling. Because, you know, your ur the urges, they lose power when observed from afar, but they gain power when you're constantly thinking about them. Instead of observing them, I mean, instead of thinking about them, you want to observe them. Two very different things because thinking about them means that they're becoming a part of your psyche and yourself. But watching them means that there's a separation and you're watching from afar. And that's why meditation is very important. Oh, this is a great point. So instead of focusing on winning, focus on the process of winning. So if, say, there was a high school football team and the coach was like, all right, guys, today we're just going to, Think about winning, like focus on the win, focus on the win. Say it's the game of the championship game. We're going to focus on the win, but he never focused on the process of winning. He could only focus on the win. And so 
whether he got it or not, it's going to be destructive because if he doesn't get it, all this focus he put on to something he didn't achieve. But if he does get it, just as bad, guys, all this focus he put on something he achieved. If he would have used all that focus on the process of winning, it doesn't matter whether he won or lost, the process of winning was achieved, you know? And you have the right to be happy as long as you're focusing on your end goal. This is why a lot of people, they become unhappy when they accomplish their end goal. And their end goal can be something as simple as winning that game. It's like the now what moment. Or they achieve everything they want. Now what? Got to focus. The process is way more important than the actual winning. If that makes sense. And the de dedication to the process will determine the extent of your progress. Think about that for a second. Dedication to the process will determine the extent of your progress. And... Um, he just goes on to say again, like most people are not aware the key to lasting change is the change in their identity because you have to change who you are, not what you believe in, not your core principles, but you need to change who you are or change your identity in itself because it, let me put it this way. If you have who you want to be in your head, you want to change your identity of yourself to be that person. So if that person doesn't smoke, you're not a smoker. If that person doesn't drink, you're not a drinker. It's that simple. Complete disassociation from identity. And when you're proud of your identity, you will do what is necessary to maintain the good habits attached to it. And then he, this is a great one. So, Instead of making a goal to read one book, you can make it a goal to become a person who reads consistently. Like, see, it just, all this stuff seems so obvious. Like, it seems so obvious when it's told to me, but no one's ever told me this stuff before in my life. And, like, I'm sure no one has told most of you guys this stuff in your life. So, like, reading these books has just been so powerful. I read How to Win Friends and Influence People, and it changed my life so much I couldn't even finish the fucking book in time. Because my life took off in a way that was unimaginable unimaginable so i'm really happy to get back into reading now and just becoming a person who reads consistently not someone who's setting a goal to read a certain book by a certain time and it's and it's it's the same way backwards they say your your identity will work against you if you accept certain traits so if you if you always make a joke about how you're broke this is why guys i've never used in my entire life i've never used this these vocabulary words broke Budget, um, expensive. I never, ever, ever use those because I, I've always I've heard people and it cringe it, like I cringe when I hear it. Um, oh, I'm too broke right now. Not if you, <laughs> you can't think like that. You got to think about. You got to think you are the person that you want to become. And so it's the same. If if you always talk about how you're always late, oh, I'm late to everything. You're gonna be late to everything now but if you never let that become a part of your identity you actually have a chance to fix it instead of accepting it so this one was interesting this is when he talks about the buddhist religion and how um the two main concepts the two main concepts of buddha that he brought to the world was that one suffering is a natural part of human life and two controversial we are responsible for the suffering we endure in most cases obviously if you come down with a horrible disease that came out of nowhere or, or someone in your family dies from a car accident that they had no part of. Obviously guys, that's just, that's goes back to the first concept. Suffering is just a natural part of human life, but you're not responsible for that. But in most cases, the suffering you endure, you are responsible for. And Buddhists believe that we should live in the present moment and how the past is just interpretations and memories. And that's why the memory will never be as good as the moment. I learned this in Colorado. The memory will never, ever, ever be as good as the moment because the memory is just a facade. It can be way worse than you thought it was, than it was going through, or it could be way better than, it, than you thought it was going through. And this is why I came back to St. Louis because it's just so interesting to me how, like, when I was – 
living at my grandma's house, I was thinking about my the good old college days. Even though I was successful in drug, I was thinking about the good old college days when I moved and how I couldn't wait to get out of my grandma's house. And then when I moved into this apartment, I was just thinking about how cool and simple life was when I just lived with my grandma. And then uh, when I moved to L.A., I was just thinking the whole time. I remember being on the phone with Ben. Guys, I'm in this $4 million L.A. A, a house in the Hollywood Hills. And I remember being on the phone with Ben and be like, dude, I don't know if I fit in here. Like, it just seems so empty. Maybe maybe I should come back to St. Louis. I don't know. But now I'm back in St. Louis, and all I want to do is be back in L.A. So you, this is before I knew this stuff. You know, you cannot let your memory trick your moment because the moment is all that matters. The memory is just your interpretation of previous moments, which can be skewed, big time skewed, big time skewed. So you can't have any fear. Fear is thinking the worst of a situation. That's as simple as it gets. <laughs> so it goes on to talk about meditation. So I'm actually, uh, I signed up for a four-day class coming up for Transcendental Meditation. And so I didn't really get too deep into, you know, the tactics that they taught because I'm going to be doing this sort of specific type of meditation. But something I found really interesting was uh, the fact that meditation will improve your ability to delay instant gratification. That makes complete sense. You're just sitting there for a long time, but it makes sense how it'll really improve that ability. But something that I thought would be important to talk about is how it says that it takes seven days to experience any results from meditation. So any of one, myself included, who has tried meditation for a couple of days and like, oh, this doesn't work and moved on to the next you got to give it time. Sometimes it will take seven days. Sometimes it might take a month or two. I don't know. We're going to see, though. But um, whenever you have, like, negative thoughts or, like, just bad juju or anything where it's like you just can't get out of this rut, you want to envision your thoughts as clouds. You can't make them disappear, but you can watch them float by instead of focusing on the meaning of them. Whew. Think about that for a second. You want to think about your thoughts as the clouds in the sky that I'm looking to right to my right. And you can't just make them disappear. You know, there could be more that come. But at least you can observe them from afar and let them be and not focus on the meaning of any of them. Just watch them float by. Just watch them slip around. That's what meditation is all about. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot of ways to... I'm going to... I'm gonna, Cut, I'm going to start this right now because what I'm starting to realize is since this is my first time doing this type of podcast, I'm starting to realize that it's probably not in my or your best interest for me to keep going back and saying, then he says, or then he says, I think what I'm going to try to work on is a fluid read through of it as if I'm going to obviously state the author from the start, but I'm going to give a fluid read through as if I'm just saying this information off the top of my head because I, I really don't like going and saying like, okay, next he says, I think that's a little cha cha cha. Cause if you notice the first half of this podcast was way less fluid than that second half. Like, I think I really started getting the flow of things when I started talking about, uh, coming back to St. Louis and all that. So that's just a future, um, note to myself and a note to you guys is that's, um, the way that things I, I'm really, I'm liking this. I was that, that first 20 minutes, um, it felt a little choppy. And I started getting like a little, a little sweaty, but uh, I, I'm liking the fluid motion of this too. And I can definitely realize how this stuff is getting way more ingrained in my head. Uh, so that's how I'm going to proceed from now on. Negative, negative emotions are <clears throat> basically the signposts leading you in the direction of positive change. So you don't want to discount when you have a negative emotion. I've gone through the, this myself way more than recently, of course. But whenever you're getting a negative emotion about something, even if it doesn't feel right, just you got to make sure you got to make sure you use that information, not for bad, not where you're just going to be like, I'm just going to push through it. No, realize, take a second and realize where that negative emotion is coming from and what the intent could be of that negative emotion. And then use it as a signpost of maybe that's not the way that you want to go, even though it makes sense, even though it's secure. Don't fall into the status quo bias. Seek discomfort because the more discomfort that you seek and go through, the higher your discipline becomes because discipline, a lot of it is sourced in running away from discomfort. 
but you want to embrace discomfort. Shout out yes theory. You want to embrace discomfort because that's going to give you so much discipline that to apply to your own life, and that's going to give you so much confidence as a result of it. So be sure to use that. Like if you, if you ever have rage that comes to you, use that shit for positive change. Go to the gym and show those motherfuckers who the boss is. Start throwing around weights at the gym. Throw it into the mirror if you have to. Just f- scream at the gym till they kick you out. Unless you're at Planet Fitness, you'll get hit with the lunk alarm. But join like five gyms if you want to. Just go fucking crazy in there. I've seen so many people where I'm like seeing this guy work out hard as shit. I'm like that guy has a lot of rage in his in his life at least he's using it for good at least he's not getting a gun and blowing people the fuck away he's using it to improve himself you know so next time you get mad about something mad at your parents just like use that as fuel for the fire of proceeding to the next level or just like because i used to do that all the time like people would make fun of me at work for drop shipping my parents would say it's not going to work i use that as fuel because i'm like i can't wait to show them wrong this is just making me want to do it even more because now i have Now I'm taking a stand and I'm showing them what to do. And honestly, the research has shown that people are most productive when they're in bad moods because they're just like getting, getting after it. They're getting after it and they're in a way kind of distracting themselves. And your, your creativity is actually heightened when you're you're negative, when you have negative moods. I mean, that's just what the studies show, but you want to transform that negative energy into creative output. And, um, Moving on from that, what the Pareto principle teaches is that 80% of your business will come from 20% of your customers. Obviously, it depends on who your actual customers are. But what that actually state, what's it, it's more than just like, oh, okay, so I'm only getting, so I'm from only 20% of my customers, I'm only getting 80% of, of the result of my business revenue. So I should just Focus on the cus on those twenty percent, right? No, what the Pareto principle is talking about specifically on a more broad scale is that eighty percent of all the work you guys do in your life is not going to matter at all. Only twenty percent is. So when you're working away and you're like, I don't know, uh, like this doesn't seem to be working out or anything, like just remember, if you're seventy percent confident that something will work, go and do it. Worst thing that can happen is fail. And just remember, even if it does fail, 80% of the things that you're going to do is not going to get you the result you want, but the 20% is. And it's all about, it's a numbers game. It's just like trading stocks. Making 20% on 100 bucks is cool, but that's only $20. 20% a day, let's say. Making 20% on $1 million is $200,000 in a day. Maybe not the best example to say, but all I'm saying is like between the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, forget the other one. What was I saying? The Pareto principle and, um, sorry, sorry to, I closed the book. I forgot where I was going with that, but I mean, either way, it's basically stating that just it's a numbers game if you start okay here's a better example than that that was a horrible example by the way the stocks better example say in your lifetime you start 100 businesses and 80 go under but 20 succeed i think that's kind of like what trump did trump started a couple hundred businesses and i think only like not very few succeeded but the few that succeeded obviously paid for a, a lot of things, or I mean, he made so much money from it. But that's the the key to business right there, the Pareto principle. Just realize 100% of your work isn't going to give you, isn't going to be even contributing to the result that you actually want to. It's that 20%, but the bigger, the more you work, the bigger that 20% comes, the bigger the results come. That is what I was trying to say. <laughs> so yeah, guys, that was the The Power of Discipline by Daniel Walter. And I recommend you guys go check out this book for sure. It's definitely different to read it. But at at least you watching this, you're going to get a better idea of, or you're going to get the main points from the book at the very least. Because I understand not everybody has the time to read. And I'm kind of in a fortunate spot where I do have a lot of time to read if I so choose, which I will be. 
just because I mean between this book and the seven um, what what was the book called right here? Uh, How successful people think. Shout out Mikey Cass for that one. I traded him seven um, seven principles by Deepak Shapiro. Um, it just changes your your entire brain chemistry. And I'd encourage you guys not only to read it, but also to highlight it, to write down. I know it's time consuming, but just what I do, honestly, if you want to know, is I'll read the book, I'll highlight the things that I find important, and then when I go to write it, I'll just go out to dinner. And so I'll sit down, I'll order a sandwich or something, and then I'll just write, 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 and I won't leave until it's all written. And then don't just blindly write and listen to music or something. I like going on YouTube and typing in reading sounds or something or things like that. Cause even this book talks about how you want to associate work with positive emotions. So pleasant music or maybe like a scented candle. I mean, I, I, I'm, I don't do that personally, uh, but it works. It works because it, it, you're, you're activating certain receptors that will make you gravitate towards working just from the association of the Pavlov principle, which I didn't really get into because most of us know the Pavlov principle with the dog. But that is what I do. And then after you've done all that, and again, remember, feel what you're writing. Understand what you're writing. If you don't understand something, just reread it over and over again. And then third, talk about it with someone. I don't have really anybody in my life who actually reads anything so that's why this is going to be beneficial for me and beneficial for you because I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys out there are the same way and we can all read together and then we can conversate together so like now is at the time of the the live when I'll like maybe I'll be like I'll start taking caller calls at like this time or like I don't know if you guys have any like sorry to say like so much that's not like me no pun intended uh, if you guys have any suggestions on how I can improve this, I, I'm definitely getting the idea of the flow of reading off better because I don't want to just like read a quote, talk about it, read a quote, talk about it. I want this all to be a fluid motion, just like how the book itself is a fluid motion. So hopefully most of you guys got through that first half where it seemed very choppy. I'm not going to redo this entire podcast just because it's a learning experience for me. But if you guys have any suggestions on how the best way it would be to take callers, because I am getting a different phone number, so I can just use that exclusively. I think I think uh, maybe the best way would be like get people's numbers ahead of time and then I call you. That would probably be best. That way I'm not just getting calls on calls on calls. I think that is going to be the method. But anyway, if you guys have any suggestions for this, leave them below. This has been The Power of Discipline by Daniel Walter. Shout out Daniel. This is a solid book. I mean, maybe try to get another clip for uh, for the thumbnail right now. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, before we leave, let me see if I have anything else to cover. Um, front desk lady, there is an update on that, but I'd rather not update at the end of a podcast. Um, the move, I'll update that on the next solo podcast, non book related. I'm going to try to keep that kind of separate. Maybe I should integrate it. Let me guys, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Like any suggestions, anything, any good ideas you think we can add to this. I'm just trying to bring as much positive change to you guys as possible. I'm, I'm still like figuring out what to do with this podcast exactly. Obviously outside the guest things easy. Like I just talk to the guests and anything, but this solo podcast, I did start noticing, especially in that weird mental phase that I had that my, energy was starting to deplete and then like my content of what I could talk about started to deplete. So I think this is cool because a lot of the stuff I'll read will ignite certain other stories like like, like kind of like what happened on this podcast. And then I can feed off of that. But all the while it's sourced around beneficial information that you guys can get great benefit of just by watching. So let me know in the comments below. I really enjoyed this and I'm looking forward to doing this more often. So thank you guys so much. Peace.